<laughs> Professor Smith, what's up, How man? Doing? How you doing? Oh, excellent, excellent. Nice sleep in day for me. <laughs> oh, okay. I uh, so you're not limited on time before we get going into this thing. Okay, good. Uh, because we're gonna do a deeper dive into your story, buddy. Uh, first of all, I I told mom before we uh, got recording here that uh you and i have aged well we look about the same as we did we in high school yeah <laughs> at least i'll say that for you i don't know about me but i'll say that for oh you. no man you look identical <laughs> um let's let's go back to karma when we first met uh jesse smith is our guest for today's podcast jbk on air uh episode number 133 uh so it's been an ongoing process with this show uh one of my longest um tenured colleagues in broadcasting going back to our days at uh WHJE and CHTV um grow up in Carmel originally? yes born and raised okay um and then uh you knew that my parents I've documented this before mom was a published author and dad was a musician uh what were your parents jobs growing up um so my mom did a lot of different things but she mostly stayed in education um instructional assistant that kind of stuff and then my dad is an engineer um control systems engineer so extremely extremely bright individual what what kind of, um if you wouldn't mind what go into like that type of engineering what does he handle day to day so a lot of stuff that he did was government contracting stuff so um from my understanding a lot of the stuff that he had to do was pretty secretive uh, <laughs> okay <but laughs> yeah he can only tell me so much but from my understanding a lot of stuff that he did was um you know control systems within um different sort of military aircraft so um you know a lot of the guidance stuff a lot of the you know if you press a button it better go <laughs> what it needs to do <laughs> wow so don't mess with your dad he's the technical side of no, all he knows stuff. what he's doing he knows what he's doing for sure <laughs> <laughs> um a lot of math probably involved with that are you were you a math person or more like art oriented so it's funny um my brother's also an engineer uh he's a <laughs> mechanical engineer so i grew up in a math family and for me it was always like you know oh i'm i'm never going to be as good as math at them but i actually found that i was fairly above average in it but um i definitely took to more of the writing side you know i definitely i definitely love language arts and history so it's really interesting <laughs> to see how you know, the different types of genetics were, because that's how my mom was too. My mom loved language arts and writing as well. So, um, you know, that divide was never more pronounced than when my dad and my brother are Purdue grads and I was an IU grad. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do you think you, your uh, brother or your dad could teach a class? I mean, if you all oh, switch yeah. roles. <laughs> In elementary yeah. class, not a chance. If it was like a, okay. some kind of advanced high school thing, I'm sure they could. Okay. Um, and remind me again, buddy, I don't think we've formally talked about it, but uh, what level and, and subjects are you teaching right now? So I currently teach elementary. Um, so I've been flip flopping between fourth and fifth grade the last few years. And uh, my school is departmentalized. So I teach language arts and social studies down here in, uh, in sunny Orlando. Okay. And social studies would be U.S. history. I mean, what, what does all that cover? So it depends on what grade level it is. So fourth grade is state history. So I'd be teaching uh, Florida history um, to fourth graders. And then fifth grade is um, early U.S. colonies to, I want to say, westward expansion. Okay. Um, it's typically where it stops. Um, and, and again, I come from a background where several of my family members are uh, teachers. Were there any other teachers in the family bloodline? Um, my oldest sister, my oldest sister, actually, uh, she's been in the school system for a while, but she's going to be starting teaching kindergarten next year. Um, and then my mom was, um, in different parts of the education system throughout my time growing up. Kindergarten. That, that takes a strong person. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Brother, let me tell you, I, I still <laughs> taught kindergarten and the people who teach kindergarten in this nation are saints. They are the backbone of this country, and I firmly believe it. Just watching how they have to operate day in and day out. They are some of the strongest individuals I've ever seen. Well, and uh, I'm going to date myself, but uh, my education is growing further away from me in time. Uh, I had Miss Marshall uh, as a preschool uh, kindergarten teacher, uh, and 
the person who taught with her was Mr. Ferris, who's now the yep. principal at Carmel. Uh, so he's he was mine. He really is, uh, you know, my my Feeny. <laughs> the fact that he's grown up oh. with me and he's now the principal. That's funny. Oh yeah, Mr. Ferris was my kindergarten teacher. Wonderful guy. Um, you know, and hearing that he is the principal at Carmel High School now, I I can't think of a better person to be leading that high school. You know, he's just such a wonderful person, such a wonderful man. Isn't it funny too that um, when you're a little kid, you think he's a tall person and he's sort of short as an adult? <laughs> hey, I can't say anything. I never grew past five foot eight. Yeah. Hey, you're, t- you're looking at a guy that gave up on athletics a long time ago. Um, <laughs> uh, as far as our time at Carmel, um, I don't know. When you're, when you're there and you're in the middle of it, you don't realize how big of a deal it is and how mm. many opportunities there were. Uh, but Take me back to being a wide-eyed freshman and getting there. How did you feel about going to a place like Carmel? <laughs> you know, luckily being the youngest in my family, you know, I kind of knew a lot of what to expect going into it, but you just don't realize just the sheer size of the campus until you're in there day in and day out. You know, you got you got your gym class and all of a sudden you got, you know, a a wing third story math class the next period. And you know, it, it is a campus, you know, and that's what I, I try to tell yeah. my kids all the time because they they love hearing backstories and everything of where I went to school and um, the school systems down here are, are very different. And I'll tell them, like, I went to, it, it was a full campus, you know, it was a massive campus that we had 10 minutes in between classes just because it was so big. And, uh, you know, walking in there that first day, I was so thankful we had the freshman center because the rest of that school just seemed so terrifying to me. <laughs> early on. So I'm like, you know what? I'll deal with that once I get used to this smaller, the smaller section here. But yeah, my first math class that I took was outside the freshman center. So I had to go all the way up into that. And, um, uh-huh. you know, when you go from A building to B building during a passing period, it was honestly one of the busiest intersections in, in central Indiana at that point, I think. <laughs> Did it make uh, the college experience easier? Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And the, the transition into, into going to college from Carmel was seamless. Um, you know, it was funny because some of the hardest classes I took at Carmel, I felt were harder than some of my prereq classes that I took at, at <laughs> IU. And I was just kind of sitting there like, wow. And, and you, like you said, you don't really realize what you have until you're out of it. And just the just the preparedness that Carmel has for, for their students is unparalleled, I think. You know, I was ready to go. Who are your favorite teachers? Oh, Brian Spillbeller. He was the WHA coordinator. Um, he was 100% the guy. Mr. Ferris is always going to be up on that list for me. Um, I had Miss Flager for fourth and fifth grade. And a lot of the stuff that I use to teach today is because of the things that she did in class. So like some of the novel studies that my students do are the exact same ones I did in fourth and fifth grade, just because I remember I enjoyed them so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so Miss Flager absolutely wonderful um there's just countless people miss parents i had in second grade wonderful too buddy yeah oh yeah first and second grade i had her for her first year in first grade then she moved to second so she (laughs) taught me how to she taught me how to read miss parent god bless you again thank you for teaching me how to read that that was going to be my uh an important one to get an idea of what the education is down in florida um because it is a red state i'm just going to be honest with where we are um and I'm concerned about the reading level of the generation coming up, but what are the struggles that you see among students that you teach? Especially where I'm at, um, I always like to tell people there is a huge difference between pre-pandemic teaching and post-pandemic teaching. So I had two years under my belt teaching before the pandemic, and then everything since then has been after that. And it's just a different ball game. It is a completely different, it feels like a different profession in a sense, just because of how much has changed and how much the kids have changed. So for me, I think the biggest challenge that I have had as far as like getting into the weeds for, for education and teaching is the difference in levels all the way across, just because some of these kids that came in they had very different experiences during the pandemic. So trying to figure out where learning gaps are because they're not linear, you know, 
some kids might really struggle with comprehension over here, but they have high vocabulary, which doesn't make a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. But that's just the way it is because of how uneven everything was during the pandemic. So that has been the biggest challenge the last few years is trying to figure out where each individual kid is and trying to bring the entire level up for, for everybody. Um, I think we'll see that start to level out at least where I'm at in late elementary in the next couple of years, because a lot of those kids weren't in school during the pandemic. You know, once they start coming up through that system, things will level out. But for that generation of kids that was in school during the pandemic, there has been kind of this overdrive for teachers to figure out where these learning gaps are. Because like I said, normally when you have a student who is below grade level in reading, they're going to be kind of in the same spot or close to the same spot in all the skills. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we have kids who have skills up here and then a different skill over here. So we have to figure out how to find that balance and, and figure out how we can get everything up to a certain level without sacrificing where they are and their higher skills, but also paying attention to those areas of need. Well, and in a uh, TikTok world and where everything is a Zoom meeting, I, I can't imagine trying to keep an entire class's attention virtually. That would be very challenging, I think. Oh, it's, in, it's incredibly <laughs> difficult. Um, you know, and that that's the toughest part because, you know, it, it's funny. Um, when a kid's not paying attention on camera, you can't, there's nothing you can do. You know, what are you going to do? Send them home? You know, already... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, there's only so much we can do. So, I mean, you know, credit to to all my colleagues of just finding ways to make sure that, that kids were loved more than anything during the pandemic. Because like I said, everyone's experience during that was different. For some kids, it was, oh, we're just staying home. My parents are working from home. Everything's fine. But then you'll have students whose parents were essential workers and they were the oldest in the family and they got to watch over their younger siblings during the school day so they can't come to class. You know, that creates such a massive learning gap that creates such an inequitable playing field for for all those students so mm -hmm. you know trying to find that balance of you know meet them where they are you know it, that's that was the biggest thing but yeah I, am i perfectly aware that kids had their computers off and <laughs> one night behind absolutely yeah that yeah undoubtedly and i'll, I'll be honest i probably would have done the same thing in that situation <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> Um, you know, I was thinking too, uh, you know, you have access to a teacher's lounge. That was always like the, the holy of holies that students couldn't access. Uh, is there any good perks to being a teacher? <laughs> you know, at least at my school, our, uh, instructional coach, um, she's an incredible person, but, uh, the biggest perk that I think I get from the teacher's lounge is the, uh, the fact that she gives us a chocolate bar every Monday. She just randomly started it one day. So Every Monday I walk in, there's a Hershey bar just sitting in my my little mailbox there. I'm like, you know, this is pretty nice. Uh, my school treats me really well. So, you know, I can't, I, I don't have any complaints about what they do. I, I teach at a charter school in, in uh, near the Sanford area and they care about people more than anything. You know, they want to make sure people are okay. They want to make sure you're doing okay and everything else will come with it, you know? So, you know, as as far as perks go, they're constantly doing things like buying us lunch and um, checking in with us, doing little prizes and stuff. So I'm very, very thankful for them. Summer's off. Oh yeah. Summer's off, you know, and it, it's one of those things. It, it's nice to be able to refresh. Um, you know, I work more hours than a, than typical during the school year. So, you know, work hours tend to balance out. And that's what I try to tell people They're like, Oh, you get so much time off. I'm like, well, I do work a lot extra during the school year um but it gives me time to retool to you know reflect and then once middle of july hits i start you know getting that itch to want to go do some more things and uh you know get myself ready for for the upcoming school year you sponsor any uh clubs or, or coaching anything like that oh, outside? Yeah. um i've done a lot of things uh throughout my time um i taught high school for a year and i was a track coach that year had a lot of fun teaching throwing which was my thing back in high school. And then um, currently I actually created our school newspaper. It's the first paper in our school's oh, history. Yeah. So we started That's it from awesome, the ground man. up. So I still got that journalistic thing within me that I feel needs to get done. But yeah, we've been running that for three years. Uh, my wife and I work at the same school and um, we uh, 
we sponsor that club and um, run it from fifth to eighth grade. And we have a really nice time with it. More men becoming teachers now? I think it's about the same. I do. Okay. I wish there were more. I read a statistic somewhere that I think um, 9% of elementary teachers in the country are men. And over half of them leave within five years. So it's it's sad, you know, it's I feel I really am an anomaly. So at my school, we do have some really solid male influences. Uh, we have one of our specials teachers is a male. Um, our PE coaches are both men. But as far as like classroom teachers go from K to five, I'm the only one. And okay. that's been pretty common throughout my entire career. It's either been me or one other person. Uh, middle school and high school are going to have a lot more men in there, but in elementary, it is pretty slim pickings. Um, they talk about code switching uh, between cultures and, and different things, but as a teacher, you probably have to be able to code switch between an age group. Like, I, is it different talking to a fourth grader than it's not? That's different than talking to Ashley. You know, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How do you it's... how do you handle that as a teacher? <laughs> You know, it's funny. Um, I actually do it less than you would think. And I think part of that is just in my style that kids crave authenticity. They really That's do. True. And yeah. you don't realize it until you get there, but they can tell when you're putting on a show, they can tell when you're going <laughs> into like teacher mode and when you're being who you are. And I realized that really early on when I was in my first year of teaching that the kids wanted to see who you actually were you know, to obviously, you know, a certain extent, but I talked to them quite a bit in a way that I would talk to really anybody else. And that often, that authenticity builds trust. And I think that's the most important thing is that kids need to know that they can trust you. They need to feel safe with you right. and they want to have that authentic relationship with you. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely times where, uh, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I'm just like, I cannot <laughs> talk anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's funny. I tell them all the time, like, if you see me in public, I'm going to be the exact same as I am right here. <laughs> yeah. What you see is what you get. You know, I'm not I'm not putting on a front for any of you guys. You know, this is this is who I am. And, um, you know, I, I always say kids need to be loved. Well, they need to be safe first. Then they need to be loved. And then you can teach them something. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I've always seen it. Did you ever see any uh, Carmel teachers in public, man? That's like seeing a dog walk on its hind legs. It's a strange it really occurrence is. seeing your teacher in a public place. Man. It is, especially <laughs> when I was in college. You know, I'd see them and I'd call them, you know, Mr. or Miss whatever. And they'd be like, oh, we're both adults. You can call me my first name. I'm like, absolutely not. Nope. You are always going to be <laughs> the teacher name to me. Yeah. Um, let's go back to WHJ and, and Spill. Yeah. That was always a fun class um one one thing that i can remember is uh the challenge of having to run the automation system the board all the things involved oh. with it uh was there a particular challenge in radio that was uh difficult for you i think one of the biggest challenges was trying to figure out what kind of connection for sports broadcasting that you were doing because good, yeah. you know i was the sports director my senior year for wh and it was always really funny because some of the schools, uh, especially in the MIT conference, were usually really well equipped. So, you know, we could plug in an Ethernet cable. Things were great. But I remember one of the toughest setups that we had, I believe, was up in Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne Carroll. And they told us, like, you're welcome to come here, but our press box is about a capacity of four, maybe five people. And we already have all our people in there. I'm like, all right, well, where will we go? And they're like, you're hitting the bleachers. So I remember we had a we had a hotspot, like a mobile hotspot from Verizon Wireless, and we connected our broadcast device. And uh, John Perkins and I sat in the bleachers, and it was cold. I'm wearing I'm wearing my jacket, everything. We sat in the bleachers and got the semi state football game from all the or it was uh, regionals, and we wow. sat in the bleachers. And I'm like, this is it, this is it right here. And we you know, we were spoiled, you know, we were so spoiled in all the things really? that we got to do and the places we got to go. So. If that was the worst that happened, that was fine. But I remember it started spitting snow down. So I'm like building this little like folder thing to put over the Comrex device. So it doesn't <laughs> get wet. Uh, but I think between that and then the actual broadcast side of it, um, the fact that, you know, you just can't have dead air. 
So a lot of times when you're on the radio, you're speaking off the cuff, especially if you're hosting a show or whatnot and trying to figure out that balance of, oh, I need to make sure I'm not talking too fast or too much, but I can't just have 10 seconds of nothing happening. Um, that was a challenge. And I remember mm. still would, uh, he would kind of throw us in there sometimes. And I always <laughs> appreciated that. My sophomore year of radio lab, we were just sitting there. He's like, all right, guys, uh, these five people, you just call out names. He's like, you guys are going on the air today. And we're like, what? We're going on the air today. He's like, hey, <laughs> me, you're going to introduce a couple songs. Have at it. And we just sit there and he's sitting there looking at you. And you remember how he was. He was I did, yeah. Presence anyway. <laughs> Splendid <laughs> person. But, you know, as a 15 year old, never yeah. been on the radio before, he's sitting across from me listening. And I'm like, <laughs> well, and see, I sort of did it in reverse, or at least the way traditional broadcasters would teach you is I went into television initially, right. then joined the radio staff. So Spill sort of knew me and I had that initial respect, the initiation of, of meeting yeah. Spill. But uh, for documentation purposes, he was the offensive line coach for yeah. Carmel football, a very intimidating guy, uh, but taught, taught me well. I mean, everything that I learned in my first year at uh, WHCR, I learned at WHC. So it was yeah. a great initial foundation. Um, did you host, you did a morning show too. I did. You? Yeah. So I did, um, I called it the wake up call. That one was my morning one that I did my junior year. And then I actually asked him permission my senior year I was like hey I know I'm doing sports but I really miss doing the old uh, you know the old radio DJing and playing music so I was like can I just come in on a Saturday morning from this time to this time and just host a show about you know classic rock and he was like yeah cool awesome. <laughs> you know? and if you came to him with an idea he was always listening you know even if it, the answer wasn't always yes he would at least listen to you and there was always that mutual respect but man, there was nothing better than coming in for an hour and a half on my Saturday mornings and just sitting there and playing some Led Zeppelin or something. And I had a blast with that show uh, <laughs> because there's really no structure for it. There's really no anything I needed to get done. There was no news reporting or anything. I was just playing music and having a great time. And I always appreciated that he let me do that because he didn't have to. I wasn't in that department, but um yeah, I did love that very much because it was so different than the sports. You know, it was, let's appreciate some music. Let's, it's just a different style of broadcasting. Yeah, no, I, I did a morning show, uh, WICR called Casual Friday. I I would argue, I don't know if this is true or not, but I would say documentation purposes would prove it. I have the final interview before Pat McAfee retired. Nice. Uh, right after that Monday uh, night game against the Jets, he came on my show. Nice. We talked about it when he did the whole Razor Ramon thing. Oh. Um, you know, uh, music has become a big part of this show. Uh, when you're when you have a playlist on, uh, what what artists will we hear? <clears throat> Man, especially since I've become an adult, I think I've just expanded my music horizons quite a bit, and I think Spotify has a lot to do with that, just because they're constantly recommending stuff. Um, but it was interesting for me when I met my wife at the tail end of high school there, we had completely different music tastes. I was always on the rock side. She was on the pop side. And now both of us have kind of met somewhere in the middle. Mm. Um, lately I've been really into a lot of what Metro Boomin's been putting out. Um, really <laughs> like a lot of his stuff, okay. um, which I know, you know, me from years ago is, is probably a big surprise for you. That's a uh, shift. Yeah, <laughs> that's a shift. Um, <laughs> you know, still doing my Coldplay thing that I've been doing for years. But um, I went through when Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 came out last year. I went through a strong 80s push at the end of last year. So okay. uh, late 70s, early 80s stuff, you know, heart crazy on you, that kind of stuff. So Honestly, just kind of whatever I'm feeling. I have an unhealthy amount of playlists that I've made at this point. <laughs> it goes based off of mood at this point. Uh, what about workouts? What are we doing with it? What kind of music? Oh, goodness. Let me pull up my workout playlist, actually. <laughs> and in Florida, you know, good weather year round. I mean, I'm sure there's several oh, options, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, for me, it's funny because everything's opposite here. You know, in the winter months, you're staying inside, you know, up in Indiana, it's November to March, you know, you're staying inside for a lot more stuff here. It's the opposite November to March, you're outside every day, like you've got to be outside every day. 
mm -hmm. uh, June, July, August. Few hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, how often do you go to the beach? I mean, I feel like if it's there all the time, you wouldn't necessarily be going constantly. You know, it's interesting. Um, so we've lived in a couple places in Florida since we moved down. So the first place we lived was an area called Port St. Lucie, which is actually where I'm at right now. My uh, wife's parents moved down here and um, we went to the beach all the time. In Orlando, we're about 45 minutes or so from the ocean. Um, we probably try to hit it once a month or so. Um, and I think that's still more often than most people that live in the central part of the state. Um, I love the ocean. I could go every day. I really could. If the insurance <laughs> premiums weren't insane, I could try to live on it. But <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, Disney World? Y'all frequent that place? Uh, almost an unhealthy amount. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. For annual sure. pass holders, I want to say we had something crazy one year where we had over a hundred park admissions with our annual pass one year. Uh -huh. And um, where we just, you know, you scan into the park at least a hundred times, something nuts like that. Uh, my wife grew up coming to Disney quite a bit. So she loves everything about it. She's a big Disney person. I go for the food and the food there, <laughs> find it in the right spot. It's a good time. So yeah, we uh, live about 20 minutes from Epcot. So we are constantly constantly going to epcot especially because it's just an easy in and out uh for folks who are going for their very first time do you have any recommendations um definitely definitely plan ahead um and understand that if you're going for the first time unless you're going to be there for a couple of weeks you're probably not going to hit everything um go with the flow you know you're going to have your preferences so like for me my favorite ride is the guardians of the galaxy roller coaster uh because they're blasting music in your ears you're going around but not everyone's going to like those rides. But for me, the biggest thing that I can say, just go in and be flexible because things happen. You know, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride there is almost 50 years old or it is 50 years old. <laughs> it's yeah. going to break, right? It's going to break down sometimes. So be ready to go with something else. Not everything is going to go to this rigid plan. And I think that's what I see a lot of people do. They get so stressed out. They're like, oh, I need to do this, then this, then this, then this. Just go in with an open mindset, a loose plan, and everything doesn't go that way. There's so many opportunities to do some fun things. Um, also, if you come during the summer months, it will rain at some point throughout the day. That's just how Florida is. It will rain at some point between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. It doesn't <laughs> normally last very long. It'll look like a monsoon for about 20 minutes, and then it'll be gone. Yeah. Uh, I know that you probably have access to NFL Sunday ticket, uh, mm -hmm. the NBA league pass, but uh, Orlando Magic fan now? Uh, I still love my Pacers, <laughs> okay. you know, and that's it's something ingrained with me. I think it's part of me being a masochist that I just have to <laughs> stay with my, my Pacers fandom. But we had a great year. Uh, I do live within a 10-minute walk to the Kia Center where the Magic plays, so I do go see them quite a bit. Okay. Uh, wow. So it's a good secondary team to have. For sure. It's a good secondary team. Um, good young team, good, strong young team. Um, went to one of their playoff games, actually, against Cleveland. Wow. And it's funny because I saw something online where people were making fun of outside of the arena for the Magic. They're like, there's no one there. There's no celebration happening outside. And people are like, oh, no one cares about the Magic. That couldn't be further from the truth. They just weren't there at the arena. They're downtown. So there's an area in downtown Orlando called Wall Street that everyone goes out to. There's a huge party for the Magic out there, but the TV cameras aren't pulling that from a couple blocks away. They're pulling from outside the arena. <laughs> okay. So I'm looking, yeah. I'm like, hey, 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 hey. Right. Orlando's a fun place. It really is. And, you know, they do care about their Magic. They really do. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. Magic used to play in a place called the Amway Swing. Amway yes, Center. It's the same arena. It's the same arena. Amway just lost the naming rights to it this year. Okay. Well, the reason I bring that up, we're going to pivot back to education. Uh, Betsy DeVos, yes. who was the Secretary uh, of Education. You did was, not just do the MLM uh, segue. <laughs> I, I, that's the best segue in radio right here. Uh, was at one time uh, part of the Amway fortune. Um, I, look, I, I have to talk about politics with where we are in, in the world. Um, Republicans are wanting to dismantle the Department of Education, where that leaves us with no like 
baseline standard, essentially, right? Like that's what I'm worried about, especially as someone with a disability where they need IEPs, they need individual attention to get to where they need to be. That's all I'm saying. No, I agree hundred percent. And, you know, part of that, I appreciate our IEP and 504 systems. I really do because it's, it's about accountability, right? I know that I'm going to give my absolute all to all my students, all learners, you know, and I want to make sure that that is the standard across the board, you know, and it's, it's a form of quality control. It really is. So when I hear people talking about dismantling the Department of Education, is it highly inefficient? Yes. Is it, is it infallible? No. But is it necessary? And the answer is yes. And I think people need to worry less about dismantling the education system that we have and more about reforming it. Yeah. And also understanding what actually is happening. And that's been the harmful rhetoric that has happened since the pandemic, especially, is that people don't actually know what's going on inside classrooms. They think they do. But the issue is a lot of people who go to school, who go to a public school growing up, think they understand how the schooling system works. Mm-hmm. And until you're on the inside of it, working it day in and day out, it's impossible to know for sure. But because people went to school, they think they know what's best for education overall. And that's been the frustrating <laughs> part because I'm not going into it, it, I'm not going into O'Reilly Auto Parts and telling people like, no, it should be this part should be this, right? Mm-hmm. Because I don't know. That's not my thing. That's that's not what I do. There's a complete lack of trust in educators on the ground level. And that's where this all stems from. And that's the frustrating part. And that, that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. But there is a very loud group of people who are really making our jobs more difficult. And that's been the most frustrating part is that if you just came in, sat in my classroom, right, and looked at what we were doing, you would understand that so much of what is being put out there that people are saying, oh, schools are doing this, schools are doing this. That's not happening. It's just not happening. It is. It hasn't happened anywhere at any school that I've been in, any classroom that I've observed. It just isn't true. And that's the frustrating part is we got to get back to the point where we can trust our educators again because we went to school for this. We are experts in this. This is what we do. Trust me. If I didn't enjoy what I was doing and I didn't care about the well-being of my students, I would not be doing this, mm-hmm. right? I can get paid more to do something else, you know? Yeah. And that's that's the thing. I do this because I love this. And luckily for me, I haven't had any major issues with, with parents or anything because I go into it with, they're going to try to do what's best for their child, what they think is, and I'm doing what I think is best for their child as well. And if everybody is on the same page with that, you tend to find common ground. And if they genuinely believe that you are there for the best interest of their kid, they're going to work with you. Yeah. And you, you go in with that attitude. But that's been the most damaging thing, I think, the last several years is that, you know, all people message me they're like, is this happening? Is this has, is this true? And it's just just wild accusations of things that just are not happening. Now, wait, that- wait, wait a second. Let's let's get into that, because yeah. Governor DeSantis is, uh, you know, his policies are pretty extreme yes uh i mean we're dealing with book banning right that's that's going on actively in florida Mm -hmm. um i i've seen reports of book burning like that's nazi level stuff um i mean am i am i saying something that is not true in saying no no no. i'm i'm 100 percent with you on that and that's been some of the frustrating part is that you know I keep one of the biggest mistakes I make is whenever I see something about Florida education, I I start scrolling through the Facebook comments, which which is, oh, yeah. Reading things like teachers are indoctrinating our kids. No, we're not. We're trying to get them to sit down and stop flicking the kid next to them in their ear. (laughs) Like, I, I, I did not get into this to indoctrinate students. I got into this to, because one, I'm passionate about it. And two, because I want to help the next generation be better. You know, that's why I do this. That's why I love it. And that's why I've been doing this. It's going to be my seventh year coming up. So 
that's the part that I think is is harmful is that word that indoctrination word and it just it makes my eye twitch a little bit when I hear it because it's just not true it just doesn't happen that way so yeah with with the whole book banning thing I've heard so many people try to justify you know with this it's parental rights it's this it's that at the end of the day right with any library, with any sort of situation in any school that I've been in, there is a group of books. So let's say it's Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter has some violence and stuff in it. At certain schools that I've been at, they do not allow students below a certain age to check those out without parent signed form, right? That's just the way it's been. It's that simple. It's that simple. And they keep track of it. And the kids who want to check those out at a certain age they get permission from the parents they get the book we move on right it's that mm -hmm. simple and it's just this big huge overblown thing that turns into a culture war and unfortunately for us we don't really have any defense on that right when mm -hmm. people are saying things especially coming from the top of our state our governor is saying these things about us people start to believe it and we're like Ugh. You know, and it's <laughs> it's already scary enough. It's already scary enough being in a school building, right? We have monthly code red drills for active shooters. I was you gonna know, ask kids, you. Yeah. 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 My kids know what to do if there's a gunman in the building. That's that's sick. They're 10 years old. You know. Well, I think about Parkland and as somebody uh with a disability, yeah. I've had the fortune to stay home, but I am the slow moving target that the shooter would look for. I I mean it's I can't imagine being a kid now Try yeah. and COVID too, an active oh, yeah. airborne disease that nobody's masking up for, oh. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's been, that was the tough part because at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this just celebration of teachers. That was really cool. And I loved it. People are like, Oh my gosh, teachers are great. They're the best. As soon as we went back to school, it flipped 180 degrees, completely flipped over. And it went from genuine appreciation to hostility. And I'm not quite sure why it happened or how it happened so quickly either. But this is between teachers? This is like just between like from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. Okay. Like uh, not between teachers, but like it feels like the general public to Educators. Okay. Well, I, I just didn't want your colleagues to be like <laughs> getting combative in the teacher's lounge. What are you wearing a mask for? You know, that, that sort of thing. No, you no, know? no. And <laughs> that's the thing. Like the, especially at the school that I'm at, we're, we're very close. We're very close. Um, we're at a fairly small school and they're just good people. You know, that's the thing. But the thing is that teachers are just tired they're just tired. You know, they are, they're dealing with a lot of stuff. And again, we're here because we love what we do. You know, are you always going to hear stories about certain ones who are in any profession? Yes. But the vast majority of people who are in, who are in education now are there for the right reasons. And my worry is that this rhetoric is going to cause people not to go into it because, you know, there's always the, the stereotypical, oh, teachers don't get paid a lot. They don't do that. Right. There's always going to be that side of it that is a different discussion than what we're having now. My worry is that Florida already has a massive teacher shortage, a massive teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. If we continue with these types of, you know, fantastical stories and things like that, it's going to get worse, right? Because I have seen so many of my good colleagues leave and go do something else just because... They don't want to deal with it anymore. And I get that. I get that a hundred percent. You know, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still going, I'm getting my master's degree right now from UCF. And I, I worry, I really do. I genuinely worry about the future. Well, and hopefully you're not arguing policy with a fourth grader and it's, they have a mind that can be molded and there could be empathy installed in there. But have you dealt with, like, again, in the social media world where no information is verified, that there, there really is no central baseline truth anymore among average Americans. You kind of have to see where the person's at before you can kind of right. begin to decode them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Luckily for me, they're still, kids are still young, you know, when, when they get to me, 10, yeah. 11. Right. They, they do have a mind of their own. I think 
I think this age group is actually capable of so much more than society leads on or lets you believe. Um, they're incredibly smart. The thing that I have noticed about this generation of kids is that, you know, we can say all we want about test scoring and, and things of that nature. They're going to catch up. They're going to catch up. They have been. I'm looking at the numbers from the kids that I teach. They will catch up. This group is the most empathetic group that I have ever seen. Like, that's yeah. what's really interesting. And for all of the, the things that I hear about, oh, the younger generation, they're addicted to the phones, they're doing it. And some of that might have merit. But they have a level of empathy that I don't think any other generation currently alive has. And that's what's special. Just the way that we see them interact, they understand things differently, right? If somebody's having a bad day, they understand nonverbal language at a level that I haven't seen before the pandemic. Good. That's the thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. And it's impressive. It really is. So I have really high hopes for, um, you know, end of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. I really think they're the real deal. And you hear huh. so many things about them, like, oh, they do this. They do things differently. And you know what? We might need a little shakeup. We really do. But I firmly believe in in the future. I do. I think they're wonderful. Um. Again, you do have a conservative governor that's sort of raining down his own policies with what's going on. Um, one thing that we did do at Carmel, though, uh, we got outside. And one thing that I can re recall doing at Creekside, uh, we planted a bunch of different flowers, which then yeah. turned into a into a garden with yeah. the ability to go outside. Are you all in nature and learning outside? <laughs> much as we can, yes. Um, my school is a big field trip school. Um, okay. We... Yeah. Uh, we do this thing every year with the fifth graders called the mud walk. And you are literally just tromping through a good old Florida swamp that they check out, make sure there's nothing up there that's going to get you. But it's a, it's like a rite of passage that they do every year. And it's part of the science curriculum that they do. And it is the funniest thing because we're going through this little Creek that you can, you can see to the bottom for the most part. And then you got to climb up this like little mound of mud and your shoes, your pants, everything gets destroyed. And I love doing it. It's at the end of the year that we do. And it, it's a really interesting field trip because the first day is called like the dry day. So what they do is they take you in, you dissect owl pellets, you know, it's kind of the same things that we did at Carmel. But then that second day you are, you are in, you know, the curriculum, you are actually, you know, tromping through everything. Um, it's just always funny to hear him screaming and, oh, I'm getting wet. Like, yeah, <laughs> jump at the mud. That's what's going to happen. Kid loses a shoe, you know. Um, I had this one kid a couple of years ago who was, he was a little guy. And the mud was coming up to about my hip. That's how deep this mud was. Dude. And I'm like, we're going to lose him if we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we need the, the parent to sign a permission slip then <laughs> sorry oh, we gosh. lost your kid in the mud pile um yeah uh let me see what else were we gonna get to here buddy um is there a good i i'm sure it's probably like a standardized uh food supply for all different schools but do they have a good uh lunch or anything like that what's the lunch got a really good pizza i can't even lie like okay. every time i walk in on pizza day i'm like I think I'm buying pizza today, actually. <laughs> when I first started working at this school, I asked the kids, I'm like, the pizza good? And like, yeah, it's actually really good. I'm like, all right, I'll go get a slice of pepperoni. Um, honestly, for the most part, I think school lunches are very different than they were for us. You know, and Orchard Park was great. I I loved Orchard Park. Um, I still crave the chicken tenders from there every now and then. <laughs> but, uh, I think even a little barbecue sauce, that place was great. But... Mm. Uh, yeah, for the most part, they get a, a decent side with it, too, because for us, you know, we always had like the fruit, the applesauce, you know, things like that just kind of going down the line. They get like legitimate side. So uh, I think one of the days they get orange chicken, but they get a full side of rice to go with it, too. I'm like, man, that's awesome. cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I hope for you, Jesse, is that uh, you get to be a dad. Uh, does it feel like you get a new set of kids every year uh, being a teacher? <laughs> It does. It does. You know, and, and um, that role for me has really changed quite a bit um, since my teaching career began, because I mean, when I graduated college, I was still 21, you know, so I was still very much a kid myself, you know, starting my career. But 
know, as I get into my late twenties, I'm, you know, I, I look at it very differently, you know, and you're always going to have those kids who accidentally call you dad instead of, you know, by your, <laughs> it's always funny seeing their faces turn beet red, but no, I, I do take that seriously. You know, um, I think being a positive male role model is, is not something I take lightly. You know, I think that's extremely important. Um, for kids to see, you know, and it's been a, it's been a pleasure working with my wife the last several years too. And the kids get to see, you know, what a healthy marriage looks like. And, um, you know, her and I get to be on the same planning team. It's cool. You know, and, um, but it, it's definitely something that I think about a lot, probably a lot more than people realize is, you know, how I interact with kids and the language that I choose to use with kids, you know, um, and that changes from individual to individual. You know, if if you and I were in the same classroom, they wouldn't talk to me the same way they talk to you, you know, because we're different people. You know, we react differently to things. So understanding who you're teaching and understanding how you interact with them matter, right? For some kids, they need a little more tough love. For some kids, they need to make, you know, they need to feel loved before anything can happen. So that's always been, I think, the most important part of my job, honestly, is is trying to figure out, you know, how I can build that trust with them and, and build, uh, build those relationships. You know, that's the most important thing. If I could say anything to any brand new teacher is build relationships with your kids first, because when you do, they want to do right by you. They want to make you proud. They want to do those things to, to, to work for you, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if anyone's ever having trouble with a kid, try to reach them and try to reach them where they are. How long have you and Ashley been together? We've been together uh, 10 years. 10 years. We got together <laughs> uh, senior year of high school. And we've been married for eight, married for eight wonderful years. Um, so, and, and what age did you get married, being eight years ago? I had just turned 20. She was still 19 years wow. old. Yeah, we were young. Um, no offense. That's just, that's a rare thing to get it married is. that age. Uh, did any part of you want to wait or date other people I, I hate to say that but you know I don't know it, it was yeah. weird you know it's I never thought that'd be me I never thought I'd get married that young legitimately like 100% because you know late high school I was still considering going into broadcasting and I'm like oh, I'll be moving around all the place you know I'll figure that out later and it just it just kind of happens you know for me uh, now I'm a spiritual guy and you know sometimes it just feels like God bring someone to you, you know, and every single moment that we've had, um, has been, it's just been delightful. You know, I can't imagine somebody else fitting that role in my life the way that she has, mm -hmm. you know, and I a hundred percent mean that, you know, I, I'm more in love with her now than when I married her. And then that's, that's a God's honest truth. I, it really is because We've, we've done a lot of things, a lot of really cool things together. You know, both of us being teachers has been awesome. You know, I, I have a career counselor, you know, built in right there. You know, she knows exactly the things that I go through. I know the things that she goes through. That's been great. Um, you know, and additionally, we get to, we get to travel together. Um, and it, I've never questioned that decision. Right. I question everything. I have, I have anxiety. <laughs> I, I, question, <laughs> I question everything. Right. But that was the one thing that I know, no matter what has, no matter what else happens in my life, that is the one thing I know I got right. And I will, that is an un, completely unshakable thing for me. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know, hearing some of the opinions that people had on that, you know, yeah. early yeah. on, they're like, you sure? I'm like, I don't think I've ever been more sure, you know, and the original plan for us. So I proposed to her um, right as we were starting college. And the idea was, it was that that was pretty much me telling her, like, I am committed to you when we have enough money to support ourselves, we'll get married. So the initial idea was that we were just going to be engaged through college and then get married at the end. Um, we both ended up getting promoted at our jobs and realized that we could support ourselves financially during that. And I'm really happy we did it that way because we still had family close um, that could help us through those first couple of years of marriage while we figure everything out. But then when we moved to Florida, 
we had already had a couple of years under our belt. You know, you learn mm-hmm. how to argue, you learn how to live with each other's, you know, differences in, in living style. And, you know, you, you learn to compromise. And I think that was probably the best thing that we did was to get married at that point, because then we weren't trying to graduate, get new jobs, move, you know, do all these things at the exact same time. You know, we had time to kind of let the marriage breathe and, and figure it out. That's awesome, man. That's such a sweet sentiment uh, to say to your wife. Um, I'm asking, since you're both in the same uh, profession, how has she made you a better teacher? That's a great question. Um, she is the most empathetic human I've ever met. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, that that rubs off, you know, so she especially early on in my career, you know, when I was getting frustrated with like student behaviors or things like that, she would always try to make me, you know, see the forest for the trees, you know, try to see what, what lies within versus this person is not, this, this student is not defined by their behavior. Something is making them behave this way. What is it? Is it lack of motivation? Is it something going on outside the school, right? What is going on that's, that's causing this to happen? right? Because people don't like to get in trouble just to get in trouble for the most part, right? There is, there's some sort of external thing causing this. So what is that? So she really challenged me early on in my career to, to figure that out, you know, and that it just increased my empathy. So not only does that make me a better teacher, it makes me a better person, you know, is being able to understand that different people have reasons for things happening and whatever that might be, what can we do to fix it? you know, kind of situation. Um, where has public education failed people? I feel like uh, at, at Carmel, I know, for example, uh, I thought this was a really cool thing. Uh, my dad was a carpenter, so I didn't feel the need to take it. But they built uh, a full home with running water and electrical in Carmel. They had a, a, a shop class where you could change the oil in your car. I mean, I think there are some practical skills that students need to learn before they get out of high school too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that uh, that practicality is a huge part of it. Um, you know, and I do have to give credit where credit is due. There is now a financial literacy credit that is required. The state of Florida added that where you have to have a basic financial literacy course taken. Um, I took one. I took personal finance at Carmel um, just because my parents thought it'd be a good idea, which it was, you know, it set me up really nicely. But, uh, you know, with all the criticisms that I have of things that have happened in the state of Florida's education system, that is the one really positive thing um, that I think has come out recently. Um, but I think, you know, exactly what you were saying, you know, shop classes, things like that, uh-huh. there's not nearly enough emphasis on the trades, you know, and uh-huh. as an educator, there is, there is so much opportunity to be had in trade school you know, in people who work with their hands, it's a different type of intelligence. That's something that we talk about a lot as teachers is it's called multiple intelligences and being able to, you know, some people are going to be academics. Some people are going to be able to build things. Their intelligences are equal level. It's just different. It's just different styles of of being intelligent. So being able to pinpoint that and figure out where kids are going to go best, I think is probably the the biggest shortcoming right now. Um, you know, being able to push those things. Like, hey, I noticed you can build things like like no one's business. You should go into that. You know, stop trying to pigeonhole kids just straight into college. When in reality, for a lot of them, that's not where they're best suited. Right? They're best suited going out and learning from masters of their craft. So that's a big one for me. The second thing that I think is the over-reliance on standardized testing. That's the one that that gets me a lot just because of the pressure that it puts on, not just us as educators, but on the students. That's where it gets me because the kids are so much more aware about what levels that they're at. They're so much more aware of how they perform than we ever were. Like for me, I remember getting my ISTEP results Looking at it, my parents like, okay, cool. And we moved on. Like we didn't have discussions with it at school. <laughs> yeah. It was just, it was what it was, right? So there is a hyper fixation on it. Do I think all standardized testing is completely evil? No. The problem is how we're utilizing the data. 
That's where it comes from. So standardized test is just a norm reference test. It is just comparing where students are on a level compared to their peers. That's all it is, right? And in reality, that data is helpful, right? To see trends, things that we're doing, things that we can work on. It is the high stakes aspect of it that is causing issues, right? So in Florida, the kids have to pass the test in third grade to pass third grade. If they don't pass the test, they're at risk of being retained. And that puts a ton of pressure on them, on not only just them, but the third grade teachers as well. It causes a lot, right? And all school accountability, all that stuff goes into it from No Child Left Behind, all that is, is baked into it. So there is this inherent pressure that comes with it of being in a school during testing weeks where it has to be you know, completely silent. And the kids get anxiety about this stuff. They do because... Yeah. You know, they have expectations of themselves, they have expectations from parents, they have expectations from us as teachers. So trying to figure out how to better utilize that data in a way that doesn't completely destroy the self-esteem of the student of the students has right. to be done. It has to be done. How much control do you have over your lesson plan? Because they probably want you to teach to pass the test. I mean, that's one they, of the things. They do. They do. And <laughs> um, it completely varies. It does, based off of where you're at. Um, your school site will 100% determine how that goes. So early on in my career, I had more leeway than most people do in a public setting, but there was still a, you're expected to follow this from the district. Okay. Nowadays at the charter school that I teach at, I pretty much have free reign, um, which is pretty rare nowadays. Um, I get to make all my own assessments. I get to make all my own projects and as long as I'm getting the results, I kind of get to do what I need to do, which is nice, which is why I've stayed at the school for so long, because there's a lot of trust from our administration. So they, they love creativity. They want us to create our own stuff because we've been doing this for a little bit. Um, so I actually have a lot more than just about 90 to 95% of teachers. I have more freedom to, to do the things that I need to do, which I appreciate very much. And going to college is not a, a total success. Uh, it's it's not it's not a total indicator of success. But what? How would you? How high is the placement of like folks going to college in that district? I'm just curious. Um, the current district that I'm at, it's pretty high. We're an A district, um, so they have a pretty high graduation rates, and um, vast majority of the kids are going to some post secondary program of some sort okay um and this is pretty obvious but increased salary would help uh motivate people to become a teacher i mean I, yeah. you gotta pay teachers in order to have good ones i think exactly it would and it would also help retain the ones who are good who are already here too um okay. is tenure what... a thing too sorry to interrupt tenure a thing uh tenure is gone um for people who started within the last, I think, 10 years or so. Um, okay. Tenure is not really a thing that we get. Oh, well, and, and some people would argue that's a good thing. That you have to constantly assess teachers and kind of where they are, too, yeah. which is good. Um, inside the actor studio time. This is going to be one, one of those questions. Uh, favorite sound, Jesse? Favorite sound? Yes. Hmm. Probably the sound of a wooden baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, you were a baseball player growing up, weren't you? Um, let me see. Uh, least favorite sound. Ooh, least favorite sound. Um, a bad expo marker hitting my whiteboard and it just squeaks. <laughs> okay. Any other pet peeves as a teacher? I know several of mine had pet peeves. Just not cleaning up after yourself. You know, I, I don't mind if things get messy, but just just pick it up. <laughs> um, in fourth grade, they're pretty much in their seat. But uh, do you have any are you a stickler for like attendance and that sort of thing? Honestly, no, I'm just happy if they're there. You know, that that's always been my thing is that if you're in class, you know, if you're a couple seconds behind, I'm not really going to dog you for it because for a lot of the kids, it's not their fault, you know. Um, but, you know, if you're going to be in there, just be in be engaged with what we're doing, you know, and respect the learning environment. Um, if you couldn't be a teacher, what would you be? Probably a photographer at this point. Um, I love my photography. I love taking pictures. Uh, probably would do that full time. 
What kind of photography? I'm a big uh, like landscape and urban photographer. Um, I have been doing more portrait stuff over the last year, just um, for for friends and stuff. Um, I shot a wedding last year for my cousin. Um, took engagement pictures for my friend Ben this year. Um, but yeah, mostly that that landscape and and urban photography. What job would you hate? Ooh, that's a tough one. Job would I hate? Probably something to do with medical. Um, I respect the daylights out of everybody in the medical field. They're another industry that doesn't get the love that they deserve. But um, I, I just don't think I could live with the stress of having people's lives in my hand like that. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. It's a different level of responsibility. Um, really? And uh, for me, it, and I respect this position. And you can make some money nowadays, a plumber or like sanitation. You know, anything oh. having to do with that. Not oh. not good. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, best advice you've received in your career? Um, probably to take care of myself. Um, yeah. Early on, you no. Know, that's one of the things that you struggle with as a as an early teacher because you're trying to reinvent the wheel essentially. And I remember my my co-teacher Courtney, um, she's still a very good friend of mine. I actually just took her son's senior pictures. And she told me um really early on, she's like, You're not gonna be able to teach effectively and be what these kids need if you're not taking care of yourself first and foremost. She's like, You have to take care of yourself. So I build in a couple mental health days throughout the year um, during times that we have, you know, long times where we don't have a break or like a, like a long weekend or something. I'll build in days where I'm like, Hey, next month, I'm going to take this day off and, you know, plan it way out in advance and just take a day for myself to stay home play video games, go for a walk, you know, just kind of take care of some things that I need to around home just to make sure that everything's going all right with me. Good deal. Um, so just so we'll document it here, any goals for the future that you have for yourself? Yeah, um, finishing up my master's degree in December. Uh, really excited about that and heavily considering going for a doctorate in education at that hey, point. All right. So I'm hoping in uh, about four years time, I'll be Dr. Smith at that point. And then hope to be a college professor? Or, I mean, what's That's your the goal? Hope? That's okay. the goal. I, I really think I would enjoy being a professor for teacher education, you know, helping mold the next round of teachers and, you know, helping out student teachers, things like that. Awesome. Well, uh, Jesse, let me document this here, brother. Uh, you are without a doubt one of my favorite uh, folks to work with from a broadcasting standpoint. You made everything easier, more fun, and was always professional. Like, I, I never had to worry about you being underprepared. Uh, you always said the right thing. Made me better, certainly. Uh, and thank you for choosing to be a teacher. It's exactly where you need to be, in my opinion. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. You know, I, I looked up to you quite a bit when we were at Carmel, especially. And even before that, you know, thank we you, went buddy. to the same elementary school, the same middle school. You know, yeah. we've, we've been intertwined for a while. And, you know, being able to work with you was so much fun. You know, I remember sitting in that on air conditions booth and <laughs> that, yeah. that was a warm one. We had that spotlight on us and I'm like, man, I'm going to die heat stroke in here. Yeah. But, you know, we we had such a good season. I think that was your senior year, my junior year, you know, getting to call games. That was that was a blast. You know, and those are memories that I cherish forever. You know, and even though my my world didn't end up in, in broadcasting, you know, that's still my my go to thing when. People are like, oh, tell me, tell me something interesting about yourself. I'm like, well, I called over a uh, hundred games as a play-by-play -play or color announcer for my high school, you know, over the course of several years. But yeah, you know, I still have so many fond memories of that, and that's I think the part of high school I miss the most is, is being oh, yeah. able to call the games. <laughs> I'll do it every now and then. I'll be watching the game. I'll put it on mute. I'm like, can I still do this? And I, it's still in there. It's still in there. <laughs> If only I knew that if only I knew then what I what I know now, I would have been so I much know. better. Yeah. But uh all right, man. Before we get out of here, is there anything else you want to add? No, man. It's it's been great watching um, right. you know, keeping up with your podcast and you know you. proud that you're doing this show. Um but yeah, um for anyone watching, please thank a teacher, you know, thank a teacher yeah. today. They they need some love right now. Jesse Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Folks, to um, 
check out this episode and all others, you can make your way over to linktree.com slash JBK on air. Also uh, at JBK on air on all social media platforms and to sustain future episodes, you would really help me out by donating to the program as well with the link in the description. Until next time, have a great day and a better tomorrow.